You're listening to Talk Line with Zev Brenner, America's premier Jewish broadcast on the air since 1981. And now, here's your host. And we're back to Los Angeles. We go where by Penny Dunn is one of the leading rabbis in the United States. And he's a prolific writer and originally from London. He served for a time in Moscow. He has a radio experience, took over Radio Spectrum. I remember Radio Spectrum from years ago. And uh, he's written fascinating articles about different rabbinical figures he's been on before. And we've always enjoyed having him. And uh, tonight, uh, we're going to be looking at a very, very interesting case, the case of the only rabbi who wrote a letter to defend the convicted felon, Zaidi Mary Schmelner. Who was that? Who is the Kushner Chernobyl Rebbe of Newark, Rebbe Yisrael Tversk, will be on our topic. So, Rabbi Dunner, good to have you back again. Thank you for joining thank us. You so much. Thank you, Zev, and thank you to all your listeners and your viewers. So, let us begin. Who is the Kushner Chernobyl Rebbe of New York? That exists. This, we're going back to the 1930s, so that was a time where you didn't have a lot of Hasidic Rebbe's in New York, right? There were, there were a number of Hasidic Rebbe's, but uh, they all had very small followings. And there weren't uh, uh, significant branches of the various Hasidic dynasties that existed at that time in Europe. America was still a foreign territory for the Hasidic world. You didn't really have, as you do, for example, today in Borough Park or Williamsburg, a large number of Hasidim walking in the street on Shabbos with Streimel, Bekesha, uh, with a you know long beard and payas. It didn't really exist. But there were Rebbes who came to try their luck. They had run out of, uh, you know, there was fourth or fifth or sixth generation Hasidic Rebbes, they didn't really have a constituency. And they had brothers who had, or, or uncles who had taken over particular locations where they came from, and now were seeking new territory. So they went further afield, some of them within Europe, for example, in Romania, uh, a number of Hasidic dynasties set themselves up during this period, this interwar period. And uh, and in, in London, I come from London, there were a number of Hasidic Rebbes there, but uh, the most popular place to come to was America. And of course, New York was very prominent, not just New York, there was Chicago, there was Cleveland, um, and there were other locations in America where there were Hasidic Rebbes, Detroit, even Los Angeles. I've, I've spoken about Rebbes in Los Angeles before as well. Um, this particular Rebbe, uh, who... Uh, is very interesting because he stands out. Uh, Kozhnitz is a Hasidic dynasty that originates in Poland. Um, Chernobyl is a Hasidic dynasty that originates in Ukraine. And my research uh, over the years has shown or has not shown any connection between these two dynasties. So you don't really have any Kozhnitz Chernobyl Rebbe. There's Kozhnitz and there's Chernobyl. And there was Chernobyl Rebus in Poland. There were no really, there was no Kozhnitz Rebus in Ukraine. But the combination of that name struck me as being a bit strange. And I researched further into it. And with the help of various others, I have a fantastic research group um, called the Baker Street Irregulars, uh, who helped me out when I come across a particularly difficult uh, case as, as this one was. Um, and we track down all the details of uh, Rabbi Yisrael Tversky, who arrived in the 1920s in, uh, in America. And we discovered that Rabbi Yisrael Tversky was not a Rebbe, neither from Chernobyl, nor from Kozhnitz, nor indeed was his name Tversky. His name was Schwartz, and uh, he had come to America because he needed money. And obviously being called Yisrael Schwartz and coming from Lublin, he wouldn't have made much money, even though he seems to be very well educated and, uh, you know, in, in rabbinic uh, scholarship, that wouldn't have been sufficient to make money. And in a minute, I'll tell you a little bit about why he wanted to make money. But anyway, he paraded himself as the Kozhnitz Chernobyl Rebbe, who just come from Pressburg, and he went to different communities in New York, and he was fated, and uh, people uh, found him a fabulous speaker, and he was very entertaining. And so it went for a few years. So <clears throat> he, nobody, I guess you couldn't check in those years. If you said you're the cousin of Chernobyl Rebbe, did anybody think that came from Eastern Europe that it's two different areas? How could you be the Rebbe of both places? Nobody thought about that. Uh, he was able I, I to. No, no. So it is surprising. I don't, I didn't find anyone who challenged him. 
which is interesting. Um, even Tversky's fell for it. So there's members of the Tversky family who live in New York in those days who are themselves Rebbes. And there was uh, somebody called the Monastritcher Rebbe. You know, if on um, uh, 27th Street in Flatbush, there's a Monastritcher Stiebel. So the great grandfather of the current Monastritcher Rebbe, who came, his name is Rabinovich. He came to America around the same time. He was escaping pogroms in Ukraine. He lived in Uman, um, which had undergone some terrible, terrible pogroms in that period. And he came to America together with his former son-in-law. That means somebody who had been married to his daughter called Tversky. Uh, and he was a Chernobyl Rebbe. Uh, and he came to New York together with his former father-in-law and set himself up. And it seems that this Yisrael Tversky Schwartz, whatever his name was, um, managed to finagle himself into the Monastery Rebbe's life. The Monastery Rebbe wrote a Haskoma for his Sefer, which came out in 1937. And he spent Shabbos with him, and they corresponded with each other, and they referred to each other as relatives, etc. So it seems that even members of the Tversky family were not familiar enough with their genealogy to be able to, sh to disprove this man's claim to being called Tversky and to being a Chernobyl Rebbe. Why did, you have a very good question. Why they fell for it, it's a mystery. But I guess that people... Uh, were less inquisitive and didn't have access to information. Uh, and, you know, I, I in the video I put out about this story, I said that, if, you know, if somebody came up to you, Zev, and said, you know, I'm your great uncle's um, great-grandson and gave you a name, do you really know your family tree well enough to be able to disprove that person if he put his arm around you, gave you a kiss and brought you a present and ate with you on Friday night? I don't know. I, I you know, I, I wonder about that. You know, I, I personally have more than 100 first cousins. <laughs> Somebody came up to me and walked up to me, and they do, by the way, frequently in Israel, when I'm there, people come up to me and say, I'm related to you. You know, they know who I am. I don't know who they are. Maybe they are. I've got no idea. I've got, I've got no way of checking. Am I going to get my phone out and start Googling their name? I mean, it's, it's almost impossible. And that's now when we have access to information. Those days was no access to information. So somebody claimed to be somebody you could take a, today. You could take a DNA test and find out. Yeah, I mean, it was very today would be much easier. But, you know what? What's so? What's interesting is not the fact that he was accepted. What's much more interesting is why did he do it? Why, why would he, somebody and do why it? Why did he do it? And where was his base? Where did he operate from? Which Crown name? Heights. Crown, Crown Heights. Heights. I saw that one of the sponsors of his sefer was Rabbi Kunin, the grandfather of Rabbi Shlomo Kunin from, um, from here, from California. And he had a lot of different people whose, whose names we recognize. Manishevitz, you know, about a Pesach, right? Manishevitz matzahs, Manishevitz wine. Manishevitz was one of the sponsors of his farm. People really, you know, prominent people fell for him. He lived in Crown Heights, he had a shtibel there called Beis Yisrael or something. I mean, he could, took it after his name. And Yisrael is a Koznitsa name. His real name actually wasn't Yisrael, it was Yisrael Isser. But Isser isn't a Ukrainian name, it's a Polish name. He claimed to have been born in Chernobyl. So he just dropped the name Isser and he called himself Yisrael. Yisrael is the Koznitsa Magid, right? Oyev Yisrael. And um, he claimed to be the Koznitsa Chernobyl Rebbe from Poland. But he obviously must have known how to learn if he came up with a safer. And I assume they looked at the safer before they gave an approbation for it. Uh, well, one wants to assume a lot, lot of things. <laughs> I, what I did discover is that much of the safer is plagiarized. So he he took, he, it, first of all, it's a safer that you wouldn't necessarily see written by Hasidic Rebbe because Hasidic Rebbe, it it's, it's, it's Hashkofa and what we call today Machshova. It's taken from the Ramchal. Uh, and it's it's sort of quasi kabbalistic, machshava type things about human nature, and it's not musar. It's sort of it's it, it's like a branch of musar. I can't really explain it, but it's it's musar mixed with kabbalah. It's not Hasidic stuff at all, and it's very well constructed. I have the original manuscript of the sefer. And it's beautiful. I mean, how he writes it is absolutely beautiful. It's very clearly put together, but it's plagiarized. He just took um, entire chapters or, you know, whole paragraphs from Ramchal 
And those days, Ramchal was not a widely learned Sefer. It's only late in the 20th century that people began to look at Ramchal more seriously. When the Maharal became popular, then the Ramchal also became popular. And that was really after the Second World War. Before that time, it was a very obscure topic to learn. And uh, he took this material and published it under his own name. Didn't, didn't uh, say that he was quoting from the Ramchal. And he put together this Sefer. Somebody must have paid for it. It's beautifully put together. Uh, and it's called Ene Yisrael. And I'll tell so you what, what, was, so what was his game plan. Why did he need money? Why did he leave Europe? How did he end up in Quran Heights? How did he end up? Be, how did he decide he wants to become a rabbi? Did he, how did it all? What, I, what, I, 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 I nailed it down. Zev, I found out the whole the whole story. He had a son who um, got scarlet fever at a young age. You don't hear much about scarlet fever today. But in those days, it was a devastating disease. And one of the side effects of scarlet fever is it affects your eyesight. And medical treatment in Poland during the interwar years was not very good. And he must have heard that there's people in America who can treat his son. And what doesn't one do for one's children, right? So he, he went across to America on his own. And he decided he's going to masquerade himself as a chassidic Sherebba, because that way he can raise the funds, the money that's necessary to pay for his child's medical treatment. Because let me ask you, let me how, start with how, how do I, you're going to wonder how I know all this, because the son wrote a book. <laughs> the son wrote a book. It doesn't mention the fact that his father was chassidic Sherebba or any of that. He just says that my father came to America and Gave me medical treatment. Now, the son actually went blind in the end, but he um, went through high school, graduated, went to college, went to postgraduate, became a professor and taught here in California and was a very prominent uh, academic for the rest of his life. And he died not that long ago, 15, 20 years ago. Um, and and but he, never he never managed to get his sight back. But the father came to America and did what he had to do in order to raise the necessary money. And then I guess the medical treatment didn't work, but what was he going to do then? He'd already pretended to be somebody that he wasn't. Imagine one day you, you know, you've been doubling in shul every day as the rabbi and your name is Rabbi Twersky. You come to shul one day, clap on the beamer. You say, ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you something. You know, you've been calling me Rabbi Twersky. My name's not really Twersky, it's Schwartz. What do you think they're going to say? So he never did it. He just stayed Twersky for the, till the end of his life. But he he went. He did go into obscurity. At some point in the 1940s, he kind of disappeared from sight. And then he died in, in the 1950s. He was a young man. He was in his 50s. He died. Let me ask this question. Orthodoxy and Hasidic influence really began after World War II in the United States. Prior yes. to World War II, Orthodoxy was not great in numbers. Those that were Orthodox went to places like the Jewish Center of Manhattan and went to Daven in the morning, went to work Shabbos afternoon. It was a different kind of Orthodoxy. So here you have somebody coming from Poland and saying to be a Hasidic Rebbe, today it's probably a better fundraising vehicle than it would have been in the 1920s or 1930s. So that's why I was just wondering why would he... I think the market's a bit saturated. For that, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you what I think. I mean, it's a subject for a PhD, Zev. It's a subject for a PhD. Why didn't Hasidic um, way of life really take root and take hold before the 1940s? So it's, it's an interesting question. Uh, the, the two Rebbers who really changed things completely were Lubavitch. I'm not talking about the Lubavitch Rebbe that we're familiar with, but his father in law. Uh, the Riyats, Rabbi Yosef Yitzchok Shnirsen, and the Satmar Rebbe. So the, the, the Babich Rebbe came in 1940, and he'd been, it wasn't his first visit to the United States. He came in the late 20s, um, and he visited Hasidic strongholds in America at that time. And the Satmar Rebbe, the Satmar Rebbe had never been to America. He first, he escaped the Holocaust, went to Eretz Yisrael, realized that the trajectory towards the Zionist state was inevitable. And he decided he's not going to stay in Eretz And he came, I think, in 1947, 46 or 47, he arrived in America. 
those two Rebbes had a profound impact on the Hasidic life in America. Before that time, even if people in their heart were Hasidim, in real life it just wasn't possible. You had to shave. You couldn't wear a yarmulke. You know, you had to adapt to American life. I don't know if you, you want to call it anti-Semitism, assimilation, or whatever you're going to call it. But, they, you know, the, the way of life for an American Jew was not something which uh, lent itself towards being openly Hasidic as you could be in Poland or Belarus or, or Lithuania or wherever it was. You had to really adapt yourself to American society. And the Hasidic way of life really took off uh, and exploded after the Second World War. There were other Rebbes, of course. I, I mentioned the two main ones, but there were other Rebbes. There was uh, the Bob of a Rebbe who had a tremendous impact in his own way. And then there was the Vizhnitz Rebbe in Monsi. Uh, and there were various other smaller. Of course, before the Second World War, you had a, there was a massive Rebbe in America, the Boyana Rebbe. Boyana Rebbe came in the, in the 1920s, the early 20s, the mid-20s. I think 1924, 25, he arrived in America. He was a very significant Hasidic Rebbe. And he lived until the 1970s. But his Hasidim didn't look like the Hasidim of Williamsburg and Borough Park. They were all clean shaven. Um, and even though they, uh, you know, they were very sympathetic to the idea of a Hasidic way of life, they themselves didn't, uh, didn't adopt it in the way they, uh, you know, appeared and the way they conducted their lives. Maybe they wore a gartel in shul. Maybe they wore a Humburg hat on Shabbos. Possibly they wore Bekesha at home. There were no Strimals in the Lower East Side. It didn't exist. Such a, it just didn't exist. And yet the Bayana Rebbe was no different in terms of his chashivas, in terms of his elevated status than, let's say, the Lubavitcher Rebbe or, or the Satmar Rebbe. He was the same. But he, was, he came 20 years earlier. And at that stage, America wasn't yet ready for Chassidim. And uh, for or maybe you had a mass. Let's analyze it. And in the 1920s and 30s, orthodoxy itself, forget Hasidism, even regular orthodoxy was pretty weak in America. Yes. And if you, and if you had even had a Hasidic Rebbe, but the people, the, the Hasidim were different. They were American, maybe American born, or they a lot of them, you know, had a weak, were not as religious as that came after World War II. You had an influx. Of thousands, I, I have a theory. I do have a theory. I can't prove it. You know, it's it's not at the PhD level. I've got no footnotes. I've not done the full research, but my research tells me as follows: that essentially, even people who were escaping anti-Semitism who came before the Second World War were predominantly economic migrants. So the the anti-Semitism wasn't that strong that all the Jews of Europe felt that they had to leave. Now, we always say the number in Poland, three million Jews almost or perhaps completely were killed by the Nazis. That means there were three million Jews in Poland. Now, there was anti-Semitism in Poland and many people left to escape it. But they, the many who stayed clearly wanted to stay in a place where the way of life was much stronger in terms of Yiddishkeit. Coming to America was abandoning Yiddish Trey, Trey, Trey Medina, right? That was the expression. For Trey, Trey Medina, after the Second World War, Europe was over. It was done. You know, people who tried to reestablish themselves in Europe, if it was Eastern Europe, there was communism. And in, you know, in the places which were not affected by communism, they, you know, they just couldn't set their roots there. And the place that they could go where there was money and where it would be possible to reestablish themselves was either America or Eretz Israel. And that's what happened. You know, Jewish life in America and Israel, Palestine, as it was then before the Second World War, was not strong. It was there and it was established, but it wasn't strong. The strength in terms of Orthodox Yiddishkeit only really established itself in terms of not Europe as a center after the Second World War. And I think that's because... There was no choice. The people who came, you know, these were people who had the strength of feeling not to have left Europe before the Holocaust. Now they found themselves somewhere else and they were going to make sure to recreate the shtetl, to recreate the European way of life now in America. And that had not been possible before the Second World War. That's Where's my theory. The 
Now we can write the PhDs there. Let's do it together. <laughs> Let's do it. Okay. Rabbi Penny Dunner is our guest, senior rabbi, Beverly Synagogue, prolific writer, one of America's top rabbis. He always has some great stories that he's able to talk about. He was in Moscow. He also has a radio background. The radio spectrum in England was failing. He took it over, became very popular. We have to talk about expanding your spectrum here in the United States as well with the radio. But uh, yeah, he's sure. a popular writer, a podcaster. And we're going to continue our conversation right after these messages. You're listening to Talk Line with Zev Brenner, America's premier Jewish broadcast on the air since 1981. And now, here's your host. Welcome back to the program, Mom. Zev Brenner, Rabbi Penny Donner is with us from Los Angeles, senior rabbi uh, at, at the Beverly Hills Synagogue, prolific writer, podcaster, radio broadcaster. And we have a ton of calls, so please get to please be brief and succinct and to the point. Let's go to Debbie in Brooklyn. Go, Debbie in Brooklyn, your question for our guests. Go ahead. Oh, good I good don't luck. have a question. I just want to say that my father grew up in Borough Park in the 1920s, and he was lucky, Baruch Hashem, to um, attend first MTJ. And from there, he looked for a Masifta when he was 15, and he was a Talmud of David Leibowitz who had a tremendous impact on the Bachram of those days. Unfortunately, Rabbi Leibowitz was the in 1941, um, but he was, had a tremendous impact on boys in those years. A very big problem, though, was communism, believe it or not, um, and that really influenced the youth. There were no Beis Yaakov at that point and very few yeshivas, but my father was lucky enough to find a mentor, um, but there was definitely communism in America at that point. Rabbi Dunner, any comments? Well, Rabbi Leibowitz was an incredible force. Of course, he was a Litvak. He wasn't a Chosid. But he was a tremendous force for good. And his son, Rabbi Henach, who was a Shiva of Chofetz Chaim Yeshiva, which then went to Queens. And uh, Chofetz Chaim has had an incredible impact on American Orthodox Jewry. Uh, you know, they send out their graduates to open schools and uh, to be the rabbis of shuls across the United States. And quietly, they have had such an impact on American orthodoxy and done such amazing work. But as uh, as your caller said, uh, it all began before the Second World War, and the impact began. It's very sad that Rabbi Leibowitz died in 1941, but Baruch Hashem, Chovitz Chaim Yeshivas um, and schools continue to have a tremendous impact, and his, uh, his Mesir Snefesh and that of his son continues uh, to endure. And what's amazing is my father said that they didn't even know if the Shiva would have any continuity because the Penach was only a little bit older than everyone else. Yes. And yet my parents were the iconic Kolo couple, the first Kolo couple in America um, in the 1940s. And um, it's just such a couple to speak to, Rabbi Dunner. And thank you so mm -hmm. much, um, um, Zev, for bringing Rabbi Dunner on the show. And, and send me an email because I'll put you in touch with Rabbi Donner as well because it maybe it could be good for my future book. But thank you for a really a great phone call. Thank you so much. Good luck. Okay, let's go on. Uh, okay, you're on. You're on the air. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Hi, it's Rifke. Rifke from Bar Park. Yes. Uh, Rifke uh, from Bar Park. Yeah. I like this uh, previous caller. So my um, parents, uh, my mother is was American born and lived in the early days in Williamsburg and my father came from Europe. He went through the camp and he was cousin. Um the people I you don't know what he was talking about that people were I think that might have been more prevalent during the nineteen twenties when the stock market that hard time. But in the thirties and forties there was a lot of kite, especially in Williamsburg, around Torvadat, the Yeshiva Torvadat. Are you familiar with that, Rabbi Donna? Yes, I'm familiar with it. Hello. Of course I am, and, and Rabbi the Malach, Yeshiva Torvadat, was very Hasidic, so he came from a Lubavitch background, and he was very influential, uh, but it was limited. So that means that, you know, he had his Hebra who were who were very... Uh, committed to that way of life. But the, by the way, their parents gave them a very hard time. They weren't proud of their children 
for abandoning, I don't know, a college education and the possibility of making money to make a parnosa if you were, a, you know, a full on chassidish yid in those days was extremely difficult. You couldn't get a job if you had a beard and you couldn't get a job if you if you insisted on wearing a yarmulke. Um, unless, of course, you were, in, you were servicing the from Jewish community, if you were a shaykhet or if you were a butcher or something like that. But to get a mainstream job with a guaranteed salary was extremely hard uh, if you were a chassid shayid. And there wasn't the, the predominant um, uh, um, community that you have now. And therefore, with an, in and of itself, you know, you didn't have, for example, chassid Jews who were landlords or who owned nursing homes or who could conduct business in, 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 the, in the setting and the environment of the America of the 1930s and 40s with the same ease that one can do it now. I'm not saying it's easy. Of course, it's a challenge even now, but it's much less challenging in the sense that many people have trod that path and have, and have created the possibility to, to make money in that way. And uh, in those days, you, you had to sometimes abandon some of the outer trappings of a chassidish way of life, or even a litvish way of life, in order to get ahead. And I think that those individuals, those yechidim, who did it, are so admirable, because they're the ones who really were the pioneers to create the possibility for those who did it uh, later on, and who continue to do it today. And we think to ourselves today, of course, that's the way it should be. I mean, Lakewood's got 100,000 from Jews, and why wouldn't it be different? You know, Lakewood was, uh, uh, just to give one example, Lakewood was a resort town with a lot of kosher hotels, but you know the, the shul there was very parav. It was a modern Orthodox shul, very, very parav. And the people who came to the hotels for, let's say, Pesach for the summer were you know, the, the very uh, shallow end of the Orthodox world. And BMG, the Lakewood yeshiva that we know, was very small and struggled. And Rabbi Kotler didn't actually live in Lakewood. He lived in Borough Park, and he was spent most of his time on the road raising money. So the scene was very, very different and a lot tougher in those days for Frum Jews. Rivka, does that answer your question? Uh, well, I want to say something else. Is uh, Rabbi Donna familiar with Torah Vadas? Because my mother said that Rabbi Mendel tried to make the yeshiva bochum in Torah Vadas a, a little towards Hasidish with the way they dress. He, he worked on, on that aspect of it. Is he familiar am, with that? I am familiar with it. Um, you know, the, the fact is that Torah Vadas was a beacon of light, it was a lighthouse for the from Jewish community. And, uh, uh, and Rabbi Mendelowitz, who insisted on being called Mr. Mendelowitz, you know, it's his Leviah, Rabbi Aaron Kotler said, as nish given Mr. Mendelowitz, as given Mr. Mendelowitz. He changed the word because he was, he was, a, uh, you know, he had superpowers. He managed to create a yeshiva yeshmi ayin. No one did what he did. And he, he was the one who created this first yeshiva in America, which insisted on the standards that we all take for granted today in the yeshiva world but which in those days was, they just didn't exist. In Europe, it existed. It didn't exist in the United States. And yes, he did insist that the Bochrim appear from and behaved from, etc. And to the extent that he was able to be successful, he was successful. But many of those who went to Taravadas later on, for example, I'm not saying that this is a bad thing, but they went to college or went to Yeshiva University, took jobs um, and you know didn't stay on the path as they do today when they leave a yeshiva like Torah Vadas. You know, it, 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 did, it wasn't a natural outcome that a bocher, even if they behaved like yeshiva bocher and Torah Vadas, that later on, that that was the way they conducted themselves. And you know, I've met many people in their 80s, 70s, 80s, and even 90s who went to Torah Vadas in those days. And they're not a great reflection necessarily of what uh, Rabbi Mendelowitz wanted to achieve. So the Pshag of Fievel was an incredibly important figure in the formation of orthodoxy in America. And he was extremely successful based on the circumstances he found himself in. But, uh, you know, today, of course, the foundations that he built have created something which is much greater and broader and deeper. Anyway, Rifki, thank you for your phone call. Thank yeah, you, Rifki. I just want to say one other thing, that the, when the... When the people came from Europe. I mean, my father was one that came from 
from uh, Romania, from Europe, they they were able to settle in America in Williamsburg because they had a good foundation there. Yes, it was in those days that was considered a good foundation. Today, looking back on it, a hundred years later, that you know that community in Williamsburg wouldn't be considered so tremendous. If you were thinking of moving to a community today and you were looking for something which is a solid foundation for from way of life you wouldn't necessarily say that the Williamsburg of 1925 is the place that you would go to I'm not suggesting that that was a bad thing it was the best that was available then but the best that was available then doesn't compare to the best that is available now 100 years later and Rifki, thank you for your good phone call yeah, thank you uh, let's go to Shalom in Brooklyn Shalom in Brooklyn thank you for waiting you have a question for Ray Donner Shalom are you there Okay, we're this, then we'll, we'll get back to that caller. I, I was just curious because, you know, getting back to the Kushner's Chernobyl Rebbe, he, he was an interesting personality. He needed to raise money, as you pointed out, but he also had an affiliation with a convicted felon. Tell us about Zaidi Mayer. Zaidi Mayer Schmelner. Oh, Zaidi Mayer Schmelner was quite a character. He was a Kamarna Enikel, and he came to America. Um, he from Romania. He was uh, he was very very prominent in in Romania. He was the son-in-law of the Shotzer, the Rov of Shots, uh, which made him a brother-in-law of the Shotzer Rebbe in London. Uh, and he was a very charismatic individual. His wife died young, and he had two sons, and he couldn't support them. So he went to Paris, and maybe he learned French. I'm not quite sure. And he ended up in New York, and in New York. He got involved in promoting himself as a miracle worker. And if you gave him um, certain amounts of money, and it was very carefully calibrated, the amounts of money, um, he could ensure that all the things that were wrong in your life could be righted. And he had uh, an interesting woman who worked for him. Her name was Mary Bird. Uh, actually, her name was Berdichevsky. Um, but she, she carried herself as his assistant. And she had a chauffeur-driven car, and she would go to Brooklyn and collect the money and the names of the people who needed the brochus, and she would bring it back to Rabbi Shmelna, who lived in, in the Upper West Side, and he would give the people the brochus. Anyway, he was uh, convicted for grand larceny and theft uh, in the 1930s because they discovered he just took the money and he uh, was, you know, he promised people all kinds of returns, and of course, those returns never materialized we're talking about millions of dollars and he took the money and it was, it was a fortune uh, it was it was uh, quite remarkable he took the money and he would just give it to charity it's like a bit of a robin hood uh, but as i pointed out on my video robin hood took money from the rich and gave it to the poor zayda meyer schmelner took money from the poor and gave it to the poor so you know it wasn't it wasn't quite as altruistic anyway he went to jail for quite a number of years i think six years he came out and disappeared without trace. But there was only one rabbi, Rebbe, who defended him, and that was this Koznitz Chernobyl Rebbe of New York, Rabbi Yisrael Tversky or Rabbi Yisrael Schwartz. Uh, he, he was the one who defended him. He wrote an article in a newspaper. It was, it was actually never published, but I have the original letter that he wrote. I have the draft, and I, ha and I have the final uh, of the letter that he wrote defending Zayda Meir Schmelner. Nobody else defended Zayda Meir Schmelner. Why? Because he was a crook, and uh, I guess they didn't want to be tarnished by uh, by association. He was absolutely a crook. There was no question about it. And he behaved rather strangely in court. He'd have outbursts and scream at the judge in, in Yiddish, and they would take him away to the cells. And it was all a terrible chidl Hashem. But at one time in the 19, early 1930s, he was the biggest Orthodox Baldstocker um, outside Europe. He would send thousands and thousands of dollars on a monthly basis to all kinds of causes in Europe. And he would give people money and he supported people. He was, he was a bit mad. It's a bit crazy. He, you know, he took money, stole money to give money. I don't think he ended up with any money himself. And uh, he, he faded into obscurity. What's his, what's his Rabbi Yisrael Tversky connection? Why is Rabbi Tversky? I think my, my guess is that he took money from him. That means um, Tversky, Schwartz, received money from Schmelner at one point when he needed it. And he had a cross to him. He was grateful to him. Uh, 
for having taken care of his needs when uh, when he was in need. And now he wants to repay that good turn by um, defending him uh, when he was in trouble. That's my guess. Shalom, uh, Shalom in Brooklyn, your question or comment for Rabbi Penny Dunner. Go ahead. Hello, Rabbi Dunner. Good luck. It's a privilege to speak with you. I want to mention to you, hello, you hear me? Yes, you're on there. I hear you perfectly. That there was a, there's another sample of a Rabbi from London itself, a Rabbi who calls himself a Triske Rabbi, Rabbi Yaakov Arya from London, who was really the Zinkov Rabbi. And when he saw that he wasn't successful as Zinkov, then he called himself Triske Rabbi. He, 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 he came from the lineage of a, of a grandfather who passed away before the Triske Magid, before the Triske Magid, and therefore he was never Memalamokan. And the real Malamokim of Trisk was the Rab Moshe Mordechai of Trisk in Lublin in Poland. He was the real descendant and the real Memalamokim. I just saw this. this was... I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with the story, and I knew his son, Reb Chaim Munya, um, who, who passed away probably about 15, 20 years ago. Um, he was a very fine person. They had a shtibel, the Trisk shtibel on Kaysnuf Road. And uh, he has very fine descendants, I have to say, Satna Hasidim, um, who run a shop in Golders Green called K's. So they're no longer in the Rebbe business. But for a time, you're absolutely right. The Triska Rebbe was uh, known as an Admar in London. Okay, thank you for a good, good pointing that out, Shalom. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we just have a few moments left uh, with Rabbi Penny Dunner. So this is a fascinating story. How do you come across some of these interesting personalities, characters? You write about them, rogues. How do you rogues, find rogues, rascals, and rapscallions? Because I, people call me, or I, you know, I stumble across a story somewhere. I'm doing some genealogical research, and something crops up, and I think to myself, that looks interesting, and I look into it further. Very often, I'm tipped off. Somebody tips me off with a with a piece of information. They don't know the whole story, but they give me some random piece of information about somebody that they've heard. And they say, do you know anything about this, Rabbi Duna? And sometimes I do, and sometimes I don't. But uh, then I put it out to my Baker Street irregulars. I get a lot of uh, information that way. And uh, researchers who help me in the work, and I'm, I always acknowledge them in my videos and my books. Uh, but, you know, putting together the story is really constructing a narrative. It's like putting something together, making all the pieces come together like a big jigsaw puzzle. It's not just something you hear at the back of the Bismedrish or over Chulnt at Kiddush. I'd, I'd like to create a narrative that really has a beginning, a middle and an end and is interesting and, and is gripping all the way through. And there's so many interesting lives, vignettes people who are marginal, people who, who floated on the margins of Jewish life at some point in recent Jewish history, who are worthy at least of some attention, and I try and give it to them. So who's getting your attention next? So I'm, I'm now looking at, a, there's a few interesting stories coming up. Um, one of them is Michalina Araten. It's a very interesting story about a, um, the daughter of a Gera Chosid, who was kidnapped, or at least ostensibly kidnapped by Catholics and converted to Catholicism and became, a, 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 became a Catholic. Which country? Where was that? In Poland. Oh, okay. And uh, it's a very interesting story because her father really battled the Catholic Church and used government officials. He had a lot of money. He was a very wealthy man to try and get his daughter back. He, he never succeeded. And it was a very prominent family later on in Eretz Israel. And uh, the story of what happened to Michalina has, herself is fascinating. I'm not going to give it all away now, but hopefully in the video you'll see that. Another well, story is the story of the, uh, um, the uh, Chernobyl Rebbe. Um, he was, his name was uh, Rebdovin Modcha Tversky. Uh, and he was also a very interesting man. He was, um, you know, it's, he, he, was, he was the Tolna Rebbe came from the Chernobyl dynasty. He was the first Tolner Rebbe in America. And he got himself involved in all kinds of shenanigans. And um, I'm going to be uh, exploring that in a presentation that I'm going to give over the next couple of months. Sounds fascinating. And looking forward to that. Before I let you go, you also saved Spectrum Radio in England. I remember dealing with Spectrum Radio a number of years ago. So I know radio is part of your lifeline, your bloodline. Yes, well. I, I did. I, in 1990, six 
I took over Spectrum Radio's Jewish program for a couple of years. I gave a two-hour daily program in those days. Uh, I was the presenter like you're doing here. Zev, I did the same thing for a couple of years. And uh, I, I learned the trade, but then I moved on because really rabbinics is in my blood. You know, I come from a long line of rabbis. So I became the rabbi at that time of Saatchi Synagogue in London. But I've never given up the radio microphone. And here I am. So, so we're going to get you on more on your show. You have great stories and people get, we couldn't take all the phone calls tonight, but we appreciate you being here. Thank you. Fascinating stories. We should, and... have, a we should all have a kosher Pesach. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm delighted to hear from any of you. If any of you have stories that you want to share, snippets, even if you don't know the whole thing, I'm not difficult to reach. You can get me on my website, rabbidunner.com, R-A-B-B-I-D-U-N-N-E-R.com. Just uh, contact me via the website. And I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Zev. Thank you. Thank you so much. And the Chakash Vesameh. Gamatem. Call to Rabbi Penny Dunner here on the Talkline Network.